what we're doing is not just about us. If we're successful, we're opening doors for other African-American people that want to be successful in a packaged food goods and a restaurant business. We need more people look like us doing this. this. We don't want this to stop with us. We want this to continue. Welcome to Unmuted, a powerful conversation where no topics are off limits and no voices are muted. Yahoo Life amplifies the voices of Black, Indigenous, and people of color. And in today's episode, we focus on Black entrepreneurs shaking up the food industry. Hello, I'm Tatiana Pyle. Today, we have a group of Black entrepreneurs who are shaking up the food industry as we know it. We have James Lindsay, CEO and founder of Rap Snacks, Master P, hip hop mogul and founder of Rap Noodles, and Pinky Cole, CEO and founder of Slutty Vegan. Historically, Black people in America have used food as a means of resistance, rebellion, and revolution. And it has served as a source of both comfort and strength for our community. But today, we're redefining what that looks like and what that means. So to start the conversation, I want to kick it off and open up the floor to all of you. Can you share what drew you to food and what drew you to shake up the industry? You want me to handle that first, Tatiana? Go ahead, kick it off. As a young kid, I considered myself like a a snack connoisseur. You know, I love snacks, you know, going through going to school, staying home, um, I would eat snacks and I would kind of take five and six bags of different products um, and kind of put them in one bag, you know, and I kind of think that kind of helped my taste buds when it came to developing flavor profiles for snack foods. But, you know, snacking was the thing in the inner city. It was something that was quick and something that was affordable. I love that. Uh, for me, um, I actually got into food by accident. <laughs> I, um, I'm Jamaican, so I grew up in a Jamaican household where like food is what brought people together. Like you fellowship, family, gatherings, everybody always came together in the name of food. So growing up, my grandma used to just always cook and we would eat what she cooked all the time. So like it was important to, to bring each other together through that. Yes, and, and for me uh, as a kid, we always ate noodles in our house. Um, we grew up in a poor neighborhood and uh, noodles, rice, pancakes. It just was an everyday meal for us. And I always wanted to know like who owned those products. And as I got older, I realized that we're not making a profit off any of those products. And I said, well, this is what I want to do. I want to make my own noodles, want to make my own rice, want to make my own pancakes. And uh, that's just how God work, uh, that this has blown up to where it's taking Aunt Mama and Uncle Ben off the shelves and replacing it with our products. And we're able to give back the more we make, the more we give. So it's about being able to help the next generation and, and our communities. And also just constantly keep growing and getting better at packaged foods good. So that's what it is for me. I 100% agree with you. I think it's really important that you mentioned Aunt Jemima and Uncle Ben's because most recently, you know, they took those brands off the shelves because of the racist connotations that those labels and the history behind those brands have. It's really important for people to see representation of food. That's something that we don't really talk about in a yeah. media landscape so often, but like you all mentioned, it's so important in our households and our cultures. So again, I want to ask another general question to you all because each one of you have di differentiated yourselves in the industry while still remaining true to your roots, whether that's music, food, or just pushing the culture forward. What would you tell other black entrepreneurs who have a dream of opening their restaurants or starting their own brand, but don't feel like that idea will be received? Uh, when I first came out with Slutty Vegan, <laughs> I was in my bedroom one day and it hit me like a light bulb. I knew that if I would have created Pinky's Vegan, nobody was gonna come but creating something that's going to spark conversation and make people ask questions. I knew that if I could get your attention, I can offer you something that you probably never experienced before. So that's what I did. So I hid the teaching inside of the experience. So for people who want to open up a business, a restaurant, a brand, it's very important that you understand one, who your audience is and the message that you're trying to convey. And that message is really just being in alignment and moving with intention and making sure that you, your mission is clear, right? Because if the mission is clear, a lot of the things that you want conveyed to your audience will be able to be conveyed. Um, secondly, emphasize on the experience, right? So when people eat rep snacks, 
they they they're having an experience. It makes them feel good because they see a wrap on the bag. When people are eating the noodles, it gives them the nostalgia from what they used to eat back in the day, but now they can have it and it's a black owned company that's doing it. So if you could create an experience, you'll get people to come back. And then thirdly, the story, which is actually really the biggest thing, but it's the umbrella that ties everything together. People really want to know your story so that they can feel like it's tangible, like they can touch you. They feel like they build a relationship with you and they're a part of that journey now. So I put an emphasis on making sure that people understand my story. I'm just a girl from East Baltimore who my, my dad did 22 years in prison. And while he was in prison, my mother was working four jobs and I just became a hustler. I was selling candy, I was selling food, I started throwing parties, I started doing all of those things. But through all of my adversities, I always maintain my grit and my tenacity. And that is my story. And because of that story, people want to be a part of my dream and want to help me to realize that dream. So any entrepreneur out there, like make sure that you, it's, it's really simple, right? As long as you are authentic to who you are and what you do and you can create experiences for people, then you can get the people coming through the door. You can get people buying your product online and you can be successful in business. You know, you have to enjoy what you're doing, number one, right? When you enjoy what you're doing, you know, you can get up every day and work for yourself and it's not an issue, right? And that's not only enjoy, but love what you're doing. One of my first jobs was with um, Johnson product, Mr. Johnson. And I'm sitting there next to Mr. Johnson and basically, you know, his company, we sold hair care, hair care, nutrition, hair grease, um, precise perms and what have you. And I'm looking at this guy, I'm like, hey, he's sitting there creating brands and products for us. And he, he loves what he's doing. You know, so I would say to the entrepreneurs who are looking to get in, in business for yourself, you know, the first thing is, is find out, find your passion, find what you love to do and everything else comes easy after that. What would you tell other black entrepreneurs who have a dream of opening their restaurants or starting their own brand, but don't feel like that idea will be received? Don't do it for money. Do it because you're passionate about it, you love it, and everything else will fall in place. You have to be committed to what you're doing. And people don't realize being committed is the most important thing. And anything you love, you're gonna be committed to it. And I think also have a good cause for, for what you're doing because I realized that success, success comes with failure, comes with hard times, comes with uh, just like, just like you said, like being in the struggle, being in the pain and knowing that you wanna do something positive, something that, that can change your life. James and I always talk about this. It don't matter if you're selling out a brown paper bag. If it's good, it tastes good. That's what's so great about our product. It tastes good that people are gonna come and they wanna be a part of it because even you, you see the companies that are trying to mimic what we're doing, even though they are bigger companies than us, they can't get the quality and the taste that we have because people like us are passionate about what we give to our people. And if you stay true to that and stay true to yourself, you're gonna have a great business. So having a great cause, doing something right and having integrity, your business is gonna go a long way. And that's our sustainability. That's why we're still here. You look at African-Americans and it's, like I said, when you do the right thing, God is gonna to continue to bless you. So you know we in, a, we in a, a business where you're not used to seeing people look like us. So you gotta look at that right there, that we are outnumbered. But what we're doing is not just about us. If we're successful, we're opening doors for other African-American people that want to be successful in a packaged food goods and a restaurant business, they'll have opportunities that maybe we wouldn't even have because we said we're going to go up against some of these big brands. We're going to go with the diversity and show people we need more people look like us doing this. this we don't want this to stop with us. We want this to continue. And we got thousands, hundreds of thousands of African-American, uh, Latino, minority-owned business. And in, in the food business, we could break those narratives and those negative cycles and do something positive. You know, as African-Americans, we don't give us a chance. We always look at us as, okay, they got too much sodium in the noodles. And we say, well, how much sodium in ramen noodles? Uh, we got too much salt in the potato chips. Really, how much salt in the other chips that are out there? So give us an opportunity. And what I like about with the vegan thing, we're all growing. We're growing as a culture, we're getting better. 
but we also is a supply and demand, a shelving space for African Americans. We we need some diversity in that shelving space to grow. The more we make, the more we give. We can help our community by having a profitable business because we know what the problems are in the community. So yet for me, this is about us at our best. Like this is us growing up and being better people and not being afraid to grow and change. So that, that's what I love about you. Yeah, I think you've hit a lot of points that I want to deep dive deep into. The first thing is about economic, you know, growth and profit, especially in our community and especially yeah. in the industry that is so sacred to us just historically, culturally that, you know, we haven't really been able to access or be invited in. I love that all of you in your own ways are breaking down these barriers and showing people who look like us that you can find success in this industry. Like you all said, if you work hard, if you have a passion, if you stay true to your dreams, if you manifest your goals, it is going to happen. It may not happen overnight, but yeah. it can happen, you know? And speaking of businesses, James, I want to transition over to you. You founded Rapsonics in 1994, and can you talk about how your business savvy and smarts allowed for you to create these focused and unique brands? Well, I posted something the other day on my Instagram account talking about, you know, having, grown up in the hood and having street smarts, but also combined with, you know, a formal education, right? So I think what helped, had helped me is to understand the culture um, a lot better than these Fortune 100 companies that understood the culture. As a, you know, a former executive for, you know, some of these other companies, I would work with some of my reps and notice that there was a void in the marketplace. And we talked about a void of all these things that we've done, Pinky, uh, P, myself, we're filling a void that they don't understand yet. I think our street and smarts and growing up in the hood and our understanding that to make something out of nothing, and our struggles has really helped all of us on this panel be a part to push past a lot of you know issues that we've had early in our careers. Like Pinky has been very fortunate because her business has taken off pretty quick, but she had other things that she had to transition into to help her understand how to make this this work, right? But you know, I always tell Pinky, you know, that she made vegan food taste better than regular food, right? We're basically, you know, are taking, you know, our concepts from the kitchen to corp to corporate America now, you know, and that's what's helping all of us be very successful and successful. And on top of that, having an edge that they don't understand yet, you know, and you have to have that and be out the box with it because every day they're looking and they're looking to copy what you're doing, you know, they look attached to what you're doing, so you got to be able to navigate it and be, you know, light, light speed ahead of them, right? Because you know what, what happens. Most of our successful businesses, they are, they come to a peak and then you have the corporate, um, 100 companies come in and like, hey, Pinky, we want to do this, we want to do that. You know, and they're stuck in front of you, right? But not knowing that you got the sauce, but they can't really pay for the sauce. So that understanding, if, you know, just really growing up like, hey, you know, if I'm selling these, you know, these burgers and they're coming to me and they offer me a million dollars, you know, for my company, how much is your company really worth? I think it's really interesting that this discussion around black people don't know healthy eating, you know, is a narrative because historically speaking, black people have been the healthiest, healthiest eaters, you know? When we talk about our ancestors, when we talk about slavery, we were the ones in the crops, we were the ones in the fields, we were the ones taking scraps and making these farm to table meals, which are popular now. So it's, it's interesting that now like veganism is a discussion around like why black people don't have access to it. Obviously there's racism and there's a lot of discrimination that goes into those you know, discussions as well. But for you, Pinky, you kind of brought back the popularity of like eating healthy, making eating healthy cool and accessible to black people. Can you talk about why that was really important to you and how you were able to break through this industry that is historically predominantly white? So growing up, my mother and my father are Rastafarians, right? So I grew up, like I marinated in the womb of a vegetarian. So I kind of got like a head start. But what I realized is, is when I went vegan, people in the community in which I was around, they weren't familiar with veganism. So to your point, yes, you know, 
historically, black people have been healthy once upon a time and then slavery came into play. We were eating the scraps and the scraps weren't always crops. The scraps were always uh, sometimes hog mugs or the scraps of an animal that we had to figure it out, which is what those kind of foods actually brought families together in the household because we made it work, right? So when you look at com modern day communities, a lot of it is not having access to resources, right? You know, black people suffer from the most economic disparities in this country. And one of those things is access. That's access to information, to education, access to food. So to be able to create something at a time where people were doing it, but nobody was really like hip to getting non-vegans to eat it, it's big. Because what separates my company from a lot of other companies is that 97% of the people who eat slutty vegan are meat eaters. That is my audience. So that means I have a good opportunity to show people who once upon a time said, I'm not eating that. Vegan food tastes nasty, it's bland, it don't taste good. But now I have an opportunity to elevate their consciousness and show them a healthier alternative, even if it starts at vegan comfort food, right? And and, and that also goes into the climate that we're living, living in and the economy. There's so much going on in the world. People are now like, listen, I just want to start being healthier. I just want to start eating differently. I want to change my lifestyle because there's so many elements that's happening around me that could affect how I live in the next 10, 20 years. So I'm willing to try something different now. So to be able to put a restaurant in a historically black community first and to get people who look like me, you, P and James to be open to the idea of reimagining food, right? Because burgers and fries have been around since the test of the time, right? Like we eat burgers and fries at cookouts. We eat burgers and fries when you were a kid growing up at birthday parties. But what I did is I redefined how we looked at food, especially in our communities, because we were always so accustomed to eating a certain way. So how can I take a traditional comfort cuisine that has so much history tied to it and create something where I'm putting an experience in front of it. You still get that savory feeling and it's an opportunity for you to open up your mind to be able to try other vegan options. Do you know how many people come to Slutty Vegan and eat my food and they say, you know what? I'm open to trying other options. Let me go to this other restaurant and see if they have vegan options. And these are people who would have never tried it before. So it feels good that we can be progressive in this movement because I've made veganism even cooler than what it was. And as a result of that, now you see the big companies, you see the Burger Kings, you see the um, McDonald's and all the, the other corporate companies that have had restaurants for years now adding plant-based options to their menu. And that actually feels good because what that shows us is that now we're beginning to be forward thinkers. Now we're making veganism accessible to everybody at an affordable price, right? Because you can't, back in the day you can't really go in the hood and try to like eat vegan like what veganism was like super expensive but now we've made it where it's a it's affordable and people are willing to open up their horizon and their mind to try something different even if it starts with a burger and some fries and for you master p you've talked a lot over the course of your career just about you know business and you know saving money and investing and how important it is for our community to do that so for you to kind of you know explore the food industry Yes. Why was it so important for you to have that representation to bring into that industry? And what do you hope changes with that? Well, uh, it's already starting to change now, but don't be afraid to do things outside of what you think your career is. So when you look at me in the music industry, I sold over 100 million records. But if you look at George Foreman, when he started with the grill, I mean, look at the, the difference he made from one career to the next. And uh, being able to know your brand and being able to use it for something positive. Uh, when you look at the Uncle P. Rice, which, you know, now you're taking off. Uh, uh, and, and shout out to the to the CEOs of Mars and in uh, Quicker Oaks for taking those brands off of the shelves and, and just noticing that, that this is a mockery of us when you look at Aunt Your Mama and Uncle Ben. Those products been on the shelves for over 130 years. And none of those revenues came back to our culture. Even to the people that's owned the, 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 the product. And uh, if you look at Uncle Ben, he got $50 to be a model. 
uh, Aunt Jemima got $5. And we have to change that narrative. We have to start thinking outside the box because product outweighs talent. So you could use your talent to spark something, but the product, and also like me and James like to say, product do not talk back. So this is another great thing about having product that you really can do something that will outlast you. They made billions of dollars off of us. Imagine the people on this panel with our business able to make billions of dollars our product, the families, the opportunities, the jobs, the people we'll be able to help. Uh, we'll be able to educate. We'll be able to create other opportunities for other African Americans to have that same opportunity. So uh, I think it's, it's just great that we come so far. And when you look at uh, the CEOs, the, the Fortune 500 CEOs is only a half of one percent. So we have to change that narrative if we're going to be able to get our product on the shelves. We're gonna have to change even the people that's in. We need some diversity inside of the Walmarts, inside of the Targets, inside of the Krogers. So people could know, like everybody on this panel is talking about, we have quality, great packaged food goods. Why not come from us? And we could do the right thing with this. So this is bigger than us. This is us coming together. This is us knowing our value, knowing our work. And this is only the beginning to be able to see African-Americans, Latinos, people that look like us, but having great products and brands. And my whole model to the world, if they could do it, why we can't do it? Let's change, the, let's change that narrative together. And uh, I feel like we're on a great path because we starting to realize how important it is for us to get into these chain stores. As African-American owners, we are fighting for our rights because we can help our people if our companies can make the money that they have been making off of us. I'm just saying just off of our products, the products that our people are eating, having people that look like us be able to sell those products to our people and put money back into the community and the culture. And I, and I just want to end with this saying that no idea is a whack idea. So any entrepreneur out there that's chasing their dreams, never let nobody tell you that this is whack or this can't help me. Because think about it. If Frito-Lays could sell multi-billion dollars of chips, how come James Lindsay can't do it? Let's be honest. Let's be honest. We need to celebrate us. Stop trying to outdo each other and pull each other down because they have so much product in these stores owned by them. Why we can't do it? and why we don't celebrate each other. And why don't we come together to help to build these companies and brands. And even the athletes and entertainers that's watching this, be a part of this with us because we could do this together. We're stronger together. Yes, that's a wonderful way to close it out. We are stronger together. We all love to eat. So whoever's yeah. watching out there, make that snack, make that dessert, make that dish, do it. Master P said so, James Lindsay said so, Pinky Cole said so. So I'm disagreeing with them because they're the experts here. And keep pushing us because we're going to get better with time. So this is Slutty Vegan Rap Snack here. And then you have the new flavor of the Cardi B, the Red Hot Cheddar. Oh, Cardi. Well, thank you all so much for tuning in and watching and for you three to be engaged in this conversation with me. Again, this is such a necessary topic. Food is taboo, but food is culture to us. So it's ha I'm really, really happy that you all are able to engage and push this conversation forward today with me. Thank you for watching Unmuted, a powerful conversation where no topics are off limits and no voices are muted.